Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. I am so glad that you are here because each week we come out with a new episode with amazing content, amazing speakers, and I am just so thrilled you guys tune in each week to listen. If you're new to Breast Cancer Conversations, I personally want to give you a huge welcome and let you know that you are joining an amazing and incredible community. Today on the podcast, I am so excited to be speaking with Chuck and Hannah. These two are living with metastatic cancer. Hannah has stage four breast cancer, and Chuck is living with stage four prostate cancer. These two lovebirds met and have a wonderful, amazing, inspiring life together. I know you're going to love their story. But before we get started, I want to make sure that all of you know about the amazing programs and services we provide at survivingbreastcancer.org, especially our signature meetup, which is our Thursday Night Thrivers meetup. We meet up every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern via Zoom, and it's a come-as-you-are, no-agenda community. All are welcome, and we really hope to see you there. We also have our Movement Mondays, our Breast Cancer Book Club, our NBC Sunday webinar series, newsletters, feature Fridays, and so much more. I really hope you check out some of our programs and services. Head on over to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events to check out our portfolio. All right, let's get started. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for having us. So I'm just going to give you kind of a snapshot of my story, but it's the reason why I got into what I'm doing now. Um, <clears throat> prior to this, I actually uh, designed landscaping and swimming pools all over the valley. Oh, wow. Be- being an Ohio boy, I thought I died and went to heaven. I was like, I'm outside in people's backyards all year round. So I, I was just, it was ridiculous, right? And I started getting sick and I didn't know what was going on. In 2015, six years ago, I uh, started using aspirin to try to get through whatever I was going through. Um, I have something that I I call the male mentality of, I'll be okay tomorrow. You know, (laughs) you know, no 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 effect, no doctor, nothing else, but I'll just be okay for no reason. And uh, and I got up every day, and it actually got worse and worse and worse. And I finally ended up in the emergency room to see what was going on. And I was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. Oh, wow. So the, the cancer, of course, goes to where it's fed. And the scans came back that I had cancer in 90% of the bones in my body. So I was melting down, pale looking, tired, weak. My body was hurting. My back was aching. And uh, basically what happened was, uh, they said that I had stage four prostate cancer. It got into my lymph nodes and bone marrow and it carried it all over my body. And they said there was nothing else the medical industry could do. They, they, they said I had about three months to live. This is in May of 2015. They sent me home. And that night, the do- the, there was a knock on the door. It was two hospice nurses. I was actually put in hospice in 2015. Oh, my goodness. So... Can I There's ask, I, I'm What's sorry to that? interrupt your story, but can I ask quickly, like, so you're talking about like getting sick and like taking Advil and all of these things. What were some of your symptoms that you were like muscling um, so, through? So just to start out, just kind of being tired. And I'm one of those guys that go 110 miles an hour all the time, okay. nonstop. And all of a sudden I, I wasn't doing that. And I was tiring out through the day. And, the, and, and other than that, I started feeling pain. I started feeling pain in my body. And um, I didn't know what it was. And um, so basically, uh, most of that was my pelvis and my lower spine. Mm. And, and so I started taking aspirin, and it it seemed like it worked for a week or two. And then the pain started kind of outrunning the aspirin. And then um, I that's when I ended up in the emergency room, diagnosed with stage four, three months to live, they sent me home was put in hospice. And um, so I said, what do you do with three months to live? pack it up. Let's take the boys. I got, I raised two boys as a single dad. Let's head back to Ohio so that we can, uh, think the family can take care of them because reality was, I didn't know how much longer I was going to last. And so we, um, 
gave away everything we own. <laughs> you don't move all your crap across the country when you're melting away, right? Sure. So I'm just thinking, let me give it to somebody that can use it because right now it means absolutely nothing to me. Right. And I gave away all my stuff that week to friends. I told them, bring a truck, bring a U-Haul, watch my stuff all drive away. Um, the plane ticket for me and my boys to fly out of Phoenix, Arizona into Columbus was for Sunday. Saturday was kind of the last day at the at moving out of the house rental. And then I looked at my boys and I said, where are we going to stay? We gave away our beds. <laughs> so <laughs> we we didn't have uh, anywhere to sleep. So uh, we went and stayed at a resort called uh, the Hilton at Tapatio Cliffs in central Phoenix. And because the next day I was, we're, we're just going to, it's it's right down the street from the airport. We're going to mm-hmm. jump on a plane and head back to Ohio. And the next morning I get up and I go down the hall and there's a pop, a sound, a, a excruciating pain. And I'm on the floor. So I fell, hit the floor. I couldn't get up. I couldn't breathe. I was, I was just, I didn't know what was going on and I was scared. The fire department was called or the 911 was called and the fire department showed up and basically, um, they rushed me over to John C. Lincoln Hospital. Uh, it's the closest hospital to where the resort was. Um, at John C. Lincoln Hospital, they started running their own scans and tests. And uh, they said, we want to do a couple surgeries tomorrow. Like, we've got to do this right away. So I actually went into two surgeries the next day. I was laying flat on my back. This story gets crazy right here. And I just need you to bear with me because I still get chills when I tell it myself. And it's been six years now. Um, I'm laying flat on my back in the recovery room and uh, the docs came in and explained the surgeries went perfectly and everything and talked about follow up and what was going to happen once I got home. And as I'm laying there watching everything going on around me, the room turns weird cold for no reason at all. Hmm. And I'm like, you know, what just happened? And I scrunch up and I look to my right because there was big double doors at the right on the end of the room where they were taking everybody in and out for their for into the surgery rooms. And I said, somebody left the door open and let the cold air come through here. And um, and I looked down, the doors were shut. Mm. And I'm like, what is going on? And I start to come back to my left and I jump. And I'm actually looking at a brown robe, white scarf, beard and face of Jesus. I'm looking at Jesus. He's looking at me. I'm an old Catholic boy from Ohio that don't go to church anymore. So I was like, you know, what is going on? And his right foot does does like a half a step towards me and his hand reaches out and touches me on the shoulder and he's gone. And I'm laying there just flipping out like what what did I just see? What just happened? And I didn't see his face or his mouth move. I just heard in my head. I got you. And I was like, what is going on? And they even, they even rolled me up. I looked around to see, you know, was it a doctor? Was it a nurse? Was it a janitor? Anybody else in the room? But it was, it was, it was, it was just a, a temporary visit from Jesus and he was gone. Right. So the reason why I have to tell that part of the story is because what happened next just, just totally flipped out everybody, including my doctors, the pain from a broken back, two surgeries and stage four cancer stopped that day. All, all the, I was on liquid morphine. I was on, you name it. My pains started piling up. I had to take two, two grocery bags to the fire department to dispose of them when I actually got out of the hospital because they kept, you know, writing prescriptions for the pain meds kept coming. And I was like, I'm not, I don't like taking aspirin. I don't want to take a drug if I don't have to. And so what happened was um, I basically uh, did go through chemo. Uh, 10 days at John C. Lincoln Hospital, five weeks at the Mayo Clinic because I was in a back brace. I couldn't even tie my own shoes and shower and stuff. And um, what happened was I started through my chemo and it was kicking my butt. I was one of those people where the chemo was it was it was unbelievable. Um, it wasn't really the first day after the chemo, but the next day I couldn't hardly get out of bed. I just I, I tried to get up and put on my shoes. I was going to go for a walk down the hall. And I made it to the doorway, made it back to the bed and slept for five hours. So I'm one of those guys that the chemo just flat out kicked my tail. And um, but what happened on my good days was, as I did start walking out down the hall, out, out the door. And if you Google Earth, the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona, it's in the middle of the desert. There's nothing around it. So I, I, I love to be outside and hike and stuff. So I said, I'm getting out there where in my element, you know. 
And so I walk out into the desert and start moving my body, trying to see what I could do with movement and stuff. And uh, just had some inc- incredible me and you pers- per, uh, personal conversations with God, like, what gives, you know, I've been taken out of society. So basically, um, as I see myself improving and getting better, um, my phone starts ringing. And it's people like, hey, my wife was diagnosed with cancer. My cousin was diagnosed with cancer. I was diagnosed with cancer. We're watching your stuff on Facebook or on social media. What did you do? And I was like, what are you, why are you calling me? You know, and uh, pretty soon, you know, I started telling my story and I would tell them, you know, what I did do. You know, they're like, what? What the dogs back are going crazy? <laughs> they want to be part of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, he's like, don't don't leave me out. So, so anyway, anyway, what I realized was I wanted to give them kind of a takeaway. If I'm telling my story and they're getting kind of excited, they're like, "Hey, I've got hope here." Yeah. Um, then the the what came back was um, I would tell them, "Okay, this is what I did. I prayed. Um, I believe in love." When my neighbor showed up with food because I couldn't cook meals because the chemo was kicking my butt, I loved it. I couldn't believe how I was like, "You cook dinner for me and my." I just loved the way I felt. I know it had to be healing. Mm -hmm. Um, um, juicing was something I did all through the whole experience. Um, I started using a lot of essential oils, frankincense and, uh, um, lavender and different things that I needed for me and for the immune system and stuff. And then my fifth go-to was move the body. So those were my, those were my kind of like, this is what I did. And I'll, I'll chat with you in a couple of weeks. I was in sales my whole life. So you didn't just leave somebody hang, you know, but I would chat with them and, uh, they were, they were juicing and they were exercising and they were doing whatever they could do uh, because most of them, their doctors didn't know, you know, their doctor, well, my doctor said, you know, I could juice, but, you know, start out slow or I could go for a walk, but start out slow and see how you feel. So that's kind of what started me into this whole cancer world. And um, my cousin gets in touch with me here in Phoenix and she says her best friend was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. And is also writing a book, which my book had launched and was on Amazon. So I was like, I, w- I want to meet her and help her. Yeah. And my cousin introduces me to Hannah. Woo. <laughs> <laughs> that was two Woo. years ago. <laughs> yeah, so that puts us in 2019. Yes. But the same month that he got diagnosed with stage four cancer in May of 2015, I moved to Phoenix um, with my husband and my four kids. They were all teenagers, boys. And um, that was like pretty significant move from Pennsylvania to Phoenix, got rid of 85% of our household belongings. Six months after my move, um, he dropped the bomb that he'd been unfaithful and wanted out of our marriage. Three months later, I found a lump in my breast. So that whole year of 2016 was a really big disaster for me um, as far as like losing my marriage. My health was gone. I ended up being diagnosed with stage four breast cancer later that year. Um, and you were diagnosed at metastatic. At, Metast- at, yes, okay. metastatic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it was triple positive at the time, um, which is significant because cancer has changed several times, which is kind of an no- anomaly for mm-hmm. women. Um, a year later, it progressed to a point where I couldn't even work anymore. Um, and with the treatment that I was on, I was on oral chemo and so I ended up um, leaving my job, my career as an operating room nurse, which was really sad. So I loved that job. Yeah. And then a year later, my best friend took her own life, which was one of the really hard things in my life that I've experienced. And um, through all of those losses, I ended up Googling what's the five major stressors of life. And all five of the major ones that happened to me in a two and a half year time. And so I ended up writing a book about it, which is how I got to meet Chuck. Um, so I wrote a book called faith like skin, and it's a journey of all the losses that I went through in that time period. And so I was trying to figure out how to publish this thing. And that's through how I got to meet him, which is so fun. And he actually had published a book called hi, I'm Chuck, um, by himself, just, I don't know, half a year before we met. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was just like a really neat connecting point for us. We talked about that. We talked about him having two boys, me having four boys, being single parents, um, writing our books, and and a really big part of it was our faith. So it was just a really neat thing. And in three months, we got married. It was just a no brainer. <laughs> the, the funniest thing that happened, like we're having these conversations over coffee and stuff, and we're both like, 
who's going to want to date me after this, you know? <laughs> and it's not just the physical things right. either, the, the appearance, but the mental crap that you go through, mm -hmm. through this cancer world, cancer journey. And so that was the conversation that night was, who's going to want to date me after this? And I'm looking at her, I was like, um, you know, I, I'd like to be on that list, you know? Exactly. So we end up, we end up uh, getting married, uh, running off to uh, five days in California, three days in Flagstaff, came back to Phoenix and we pushed our desk together and we said, um, let's figure out what we're going to do with this. So, yeah. So I want to add this. And I think a lot of women will understand if they have any kind of breast cancer and have been on hormone blockers, how crazy it is to have, have hot flashes. And here God gives me this guy who totally understands what it's like to have hot flashes because they cut off his testosterone with prostate cancer. So yeah. he, he'd have hot flashes and I'd have hot flashes and we'd be fanning each other. I'm like one of the, I'm like one of the chicks, you know, I was, yeah. <laughs> I was hot flashing when I, right after my cancer, yeah. you know, six, seven, eight times a day. And it got down now. It's pretty interesting. After six years, it's more like uh, something emotional will happen or a, or uh, I don't, I don't know, but something brings it on, you know, so I still have them, but not as frequent as I did back when I first went through the cancer journey. So when Chuck and I met, um, the cancer I had was stable. So I, at that point I had ERPR positive for two negative. Um, and so was I it in your bones or where was, where did it metastasize to? Um, to my lungs, some nodes in my chest, my armpit at that point. So it was significant enough that they wanted to treat me whole, like the whole systemically. Yep. And I, before that point, I had refused IV chemo and radiation and had done um, really high like mega dose vitamin C and actually had really good response with all of the natural stuff till all of a sudden it didn't in one month, everything just blew up. Mm. So I've, I've kind of had an experience with the natural and the conventional and, and somehow I've married the two together <laughs> so I can use the natural to help strengthen the, yes. the stuff, the effects it has on our bodies during conventional treatment. So when we got home from our honeymoon, we, you know, we'd been talking a lot about cancer coaching and how that looked. And I was like, why, why don't you have a nonprofit while we were dating even? And he's like, I don't know. It just seems like such a mountain of paperwork and just too big to think That's about. That's exactly and what it is. So yeah, <laughs> you <really>? understand. <laughs> so you know, we put our heads together and we did a lot of YouTube and Googling and <laughs> figured it out and um, did the paperwork. And within four weeks, got our IRS notice that we'd been accepted as a nonprofit, which blew our minds. We thought it was going to take four to six months. And we landed on our name for it, which is called Living Hope Cancer Foundation. Started a website and just continued on with what we had been doing, which was taking phone calls and really encouraging people. Um, in that place where, you know, your doctor gives you a, a medical diagnosis and a medical plan, which includes your treatment, but then they're kind of like, all right, there you go. You get in your car and you're going home freaking out and you don't really have a support for that emotional and the mental and all of that. And so that's the piece we felt both each had our own experience that we felt was missing. Mm -hmm. And that's the space that we found ourselves in that we got to encourage people and through those five pillars that Chuck was talking about, but, you know, so much of it is getting involved in the doing that helps your mindset turn on into healing. And so as we were talking about that, figuring it out, you know, our, our whole um, nonprofit and our cancer organization started to have more meaning and, and we started to understand what it really meant. And a lot of that um, was also just giving people information. And so we wanted to figure out how to do that better and not, we couldn't replicate ourselves every single day by taking a thousand phone calls a day and spending the whole day on the phone. So we figured out that we needed to set up a little video resource library and create videos where people could get coached. So that's something we worked on last year. Um, and it's called Cancer Roadmap Project. So there's 40 videos there. 56 and videos there. And more recently, we, we added, added, Great. We added uh, what to expect with the mastectomy, little video series, just like a real basic 101, all the stuff that you just don't have answers to, you mm -hmm. know, immediately. And it was all the stuff I didn't have answers to. And I was a nurse, I had yeah. no idea. So we just figured out that there's a way to help people and be able to navigate all that unknown of cancer. Oh, so the, the, the Cancer Roadmap Project, 
um, as we were getting calls, we were like, we put a notebook in between our desks. It was like, that's important. You know, that's, and, and, and the calls over the last year about breast cancer, um, what to expect through a mastectomy, um, all these things were so, we're like, it's not, we, we couldn't find it ourselves out there. So we create, um, Hannah worked on a, um, a, a series of videos. Um, last week we were in Colorado for nine days with speaking events over there and between our events and stuff, you know, we sat down and she would make a little, they're only two to three minute videos. So they're yeah, not like some perfect. crazy, like yeah. writing a book. The bite size. They're, like I want the answers. Yeah, you very know? consumable. Yes. Mm-hmm. And that's yes. what people want. You know, they're used to Instagram and short TikTok, exactly. very short stuff. And it, it is, it's so much easier to consume it and get that information that way. So, and, and, and what we didn't know, um, while we're, you know, focusing on Hannah's health, of course, was number one on our priorities. And number two was taking the cancer calls that came in all day long. And then number three was um, the foundation started growing like crazy because of social media. And we were getting calls from people like, where did you find us? You know, um, but because of the cancer roadmap videos and and the help we had out there, um, I don't I, I know I didn't. I know we've talked about it a little bit, but we really didn't know what was getting ready to happen. Mm -hmm. And um, all of a sudden we start getting like even emails from South Africa, Australia, Ireland. And they're like, we are watching your videos and this is exactly what we were needing. And we are in happy tears right now. So um, just hearing that, like sometimes, especially with digital, like you don't really realize how expansive your reach is and how humbling that can be when you're like, wow, my video is really helping people across the world. Like how powerful is that? It's crazy. So the really interesting thing is we got married. Um, January 1st, 2020. We all know how wonderful 2020 was. Um, um, five months into our marriage, I, well, four months, I started having neck pain and we're trying to figure out I had heart, high heart rate, um, increased problems breathing and scans weren't really showing a whole lot. And the only thing that felt good is if Chuck was pulling on my neck <laughs> to, to help relieve the pressure. <laughs> she lay on the bed. She's like pulling my neck. And I, I mean, I know the human body. I was like, I don't really like doing this, but if I just pull lightly, it relieves yeah. some of the pain. Mm-hmm. But I'm like, I don't really want to be doing this. <laughs> so ding, ding, ding. You know, you know, something's wrong. And I was like, there's something off, but I had not experienced this particular thing happen to my body before. So I was like, I need answers. Kept telling my doctor something's going on. Finally had another scan. And again, I had all this spread and find out I have a compression fracture in my neck Mm. and it was throwing up violently from it because it was so painful. And they rushed me to the hospital. And this is right during COVID when it was like, drop the person off at the door right? and see you later. You know, so Chuck couldn't come in with me. And they didn't know what was wrong with me at the time yet and put me in a little dark room and had me have a CT scan first. And they come in the room, sit down and say, we're sorry to let you know you have a broken neck and you need emergency surgery and slap a a brace on my neck. And during that time, they even snuck Chuck in for a while till they decided they had to move me to another hospital where they could actually do the surgery. So it was just a lot of um, alone time last year. Um, going through these things, you know, with COVID, I, yeah. I can feel that a lot of women have gone through that last year with having to go to chemo treatments and surgeries and all kinds of things on their own. Um, it was a, a real time of learning for me, you know, where to go and where a big piece of my life is my faith. So that was a place where I went was going to God with it all. And um, so I ended up having emergency surgery where they fused my, my entire neck, they went through the front of my neck. And um, had to cut off the blood supply in my carotid artery one day. And then the next day I did the fusion and I ended up having a, a brace around my neck for eight weeks last summer, um, which was pretty hard yeah. <laughs> to walk around in the heat and not be able to do all the things I was used to like kayaking with Chuck and we'd go biking everywhere and hiking and uh, swimming, it's like all these things I couldn't physically do. Um, But then we figured out what could I do, you know, and eventually it was getting on the back of a tandem bike or walking in the pool or floating in the pool. It's like all these spaces that I love to be in. And um, so I ended up starting IV chemo and radiation at the same time because they were so concerned about 
the results of my biopsy from my neck, which showed that I triple negative breast cancer. So this is the third type of breast cancer. Um, and if you don't know about that, um, triple negative means there's no hormones involved, so they can no longer block hormones. So really their only treatment for it is to do a uh, intravenous chemotherapy. So that was a whole new thing for me, lost my hair, went through all of the new feels of being on chemotherapy and having radiation at the same time uh, for a couple of weeks on a note on my chest. And during that time, I started having a lot of swelling problems and went to the ER three times. And the third time they finally admitted me and decided to do a scan. And they found out that I had all these ulcerations in my esophagus, which I literally couldn't even swallow my own spit. I was spitting it in a cup, which is super disgusting, but it was just that bad. And it it was because I had ulcers in my, in my throat and I couldn't swallow anymore. From the radiation so created from the radiation. So, um, so I ended up not being able to swallow and not being able to hydrate. And so they were like, you need a feeding tube to keep you alive. If you don't have one, you're going to die. And I had lost 15 pounds in, a, in about eight days. And, um, so I ended up coming home with a feeding tube in my stomach, which is, they literally poke up tube right into your stomach and it it's attached to like this huge syringe that you pop out and put little milkshakes in and um so I had to feed myself that way for seven weeks last year and eventually the ulcerations healed enough that I was able to swallow liquids and and uh be able to eat again and retrain myself yeah. so it was quite a summer last year Did <laughs> your radiologist oncologist like tell you about some of these risks or were they concerned? I mean, there's always risk with radiation and chemotherapy, but this sounds in, to, to get to that level of being in the ER sounds like they're something, I don't know, from my perspective, something seems amiss. Yeah. So when you sign the, the paperwork, that really wasn't on the paperwork as risks There's other things. Um, but it is a known fact that radiation can cause scatter. And sometimes I think maybe even the healthier you are, your body can really absorb it. And some people, they just absorb radiation and apparently mine does. So I actually absorbed also in my lungs and now have permanent scarring in my lungs from it. But the real significant one for me was this ulceration, which to this day, I still have a stricture, a scarring in my esophagus that I have to get stretched every like three to six months so I can swallow food. Um, so it's something that I will live with forever. <laughs> Gift that keeps on giving. So that's always a thing to take in consideration with radiation. It's like you're hoping it's going to do its work and shrink something, but it can also damage the area. So it did do its job and it shrunk that tumor where it went completely away. Um, But I'm still left with high heart rate and some breathing problems. So, yeah. Yeah, I relate to that. I I had radiation on my left side. And even though they tell you like, take a deep breath, we're going to try and separate like the tumors from like your heart area. I now see a cardiologist oncologist regularly because I'm at such a higher risk now for um, heart disease, right? And, you know, I think being at these younger ages too, like I'm concerned about the high heart rate. I'm concerned about like the shortness of breath, like all of these little things that you're like, why, why is this happening, right? Like we got the cancer under control, but what about everything else we're going through? Right, so, it, it is, you, you like have to, consider all of that when you're doing all these treatments because they all come with side effects they come with risks yeah. and when you haven't gone through it it's like you're just hoping for the best so that that's been definitely something where as we navigate um and you know we have clients that ask us too and it's like it's such a personal decision because you end up going going home with those you know whatever your decision is yeah. you, generally speaking you're gonna have some side effects from it so um by September of last year, though, we, we had this opportunity, and I'm not kidding, in one month, we were jet skiing, we went zip lining, and we were kayaking. So it was just really cool because after having a broken neck and having a feeding tube to be able to get back to that space where we were actively enjoying these parts of our lives. Mm-hmm. And um, a couple months later, over the winter, I started having lower back pain. And now it was like, okay, there's something, we got to check this out you know, make sure this isn't something else. And, um, ended up in the ER and they come in the room and they're like, we have to tell you, you have a sacral fracture, which is the very lower part of your spine on your hip. And there wasn't anything they could do about it because it's not something you can have surgery on. 
um, not at that, that point. And um, about two months later, I, again, was having some serious problems. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't stand up. Um, I know I'm going over this fast, but there's just so many details. Yeah, no, absolutely. I could be here for three hours and tell you my story. <laughs> but, um, it, you know, again, it was a situation where in the ER, they're like, we need to transfer you to a different hospital and you need emergency surgery and ended up with a fusion from my S1 down, down to my L1 down to my S1. Hmm. So it was a very significant fusion surgery, uh, which required 60 staples. Seven hour surgery. It was a nightmare sitting in the waiting room. You know, we, we, we thought it was going to be a two and a half to three hour surgery. Hmm. And uh, it was traumatic to say the least. Um, because I was in the waiting room like all day waiting. And as the time went by, it got worse and worse and worse. And I'm on the phone with her parents and my parents just freaking out. Finally, they bring her out of the, of the, uh, of the operating room and I get to go in, but she's all knocked out and everything. She's Mm -hmm. been under for seven hours. So the nurse said, you you just go home and get some rest. And so I went home and I actually Mm -hmm. fell asleep with my feet on the floor. I laid back on the bed, fell asleep with the light on. I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and I look at my phone and at one o'clock, there's a text message from Hannah and it says, what happened to me? Oh boy. So I ended up waking up in the ICU. (laughs) Do you see our dog? I do. Um, I ended up waking up in the ICU and I was supposed to wake up three hours after my surgery in my room again. And I was like, something's not right. I don't know where I am. And I just felt like I got hit by a truck. And um, so what ended up happening is the, the cancer had spread so much into my lower spine and sacral area that my doctor came out like, so overwhelmed. They ended up taking 50% of the tumor that they could out. And they're like, your doctor has not been doing his job. And he ended up giving us a tip to a new oncologist to, you know, kind of figure out new treatment because the treatment I'd been on wasn't working at all. Um, And so um, within six weeks, I ended up having another surgery because the cancer had spread so much in that lower area and into the, the head of the femur, they were worried that it would break. And if that broke, I would never be able to walk again. So they're like, we need to stabilize your femur. So they drove a titanium rod into my entire femur, um, which is basically a hammer. (laughs) I hammered in. And so I ended up not being able to walk and had a, ended up in a wheelchair for four months um, during the spring. Um, And Chuck was awesome. He actually found me this little motorized scooter that fit through the bedroom door. And it gave me a little bit of my life back because before that I literally couldn't walk and I, I couldn't even get enough far enough with my walker to get to the bathroom. So I had a little porta potty next to my bed and he did everything for me from bringing me my toothbrush to brush my teeth, to my tea, to everything I had to eat and drink and helping me change my clothes. Like he turned into hundred percent caregiver. Yeah, I mean, you know, I went from the cancer guy to the caregiver. Mm -hmm. You know, I went through my journey, so I knew a little bit about caregiving, but I wasn't the person sitting there, you know, helping her sit up when she's in pain, feeding her, changing clothes, you know, everything else around the house, you know, the house needed clean and stuff. And, you know, I first started doing it, and, and what I realized is I just gave up everything that I enjoyed doing to take care of her. But it was such an important factor that I said to myself, as much as this stinks, I'm going to be number one caregiver in the world. I'm going to bust my butt, you know, yeah. to take care of her, and make her comfortable. Um, and and, and it, it, it's a big factor. I mean, her comfort, her being more comfortable, her seeing me helping her and just knowing that I'm there. You know, these things were such a huge factor through um, this past um, six months of our lives. And the cool thing about Hannah, and I hope this is a reflection and people listening to this really catch this is every bit of the way um, surgeries, three surgeries this year in pain, um, endlessly, um, you know, treatments and side effects from treatments. And in her mind, she would constantly say, this is temporary. That wheelchair is temporary. This, you know, is I was like. You know, it was a coaching experience for me because watching her was like, you know, I'm like kind of, you know, like, I'm not sure about this. And she's like, hey, we live it and we coach it. We live it and we coach it. 
So we live it. Part of it was, uh, you know, just uh, just making her comfortable, doing what I needed to do through that time period. And, uh, you know, understanding mm-hmm. completely what a caregiver does, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and, and caregivers go through whatever the person they're dealing with is going through also. Yeah. So Absolutely. in our situation being cancer, um, you know, I felt like I was going through it again. I, I think it was even harder going through being a caregiver than it is going through the cancer myself. Just saying that oh, for myself. That's hard. I think emotionally it was harder dealing with with yeah. Hannah's uh, journey. Yeah. And I haven't been a caregiver, but I imagine it like having, cause I've had children, you know, watching your own child be sick, you'd rather be sick for them than have them go through it. And it's the same thing. Like he, but he has gone through this. So he's able to identify, which is so amazing to me. Like God yeah. gave me this man that understood chemo, understood this diagnosis, knew his way out of it, you know, literally through the mindset and like challenging me to dream again from back mm-hmm. from when we met to, that daily, like helping me through the the really hard stuff, because there's those dark moments where you're in so much pain or throwing up, or you just can't get past it, where he's like, he's reminding me it's temporary. (laughs) I know he says it, but you know, it was a mutual thing where you do, you really need that other person to help you Mm -hmm. remind you that. And the cool thing is the beginning of July, I was able to say goodbye to my wheelchair and get back to walking and had physical therapy. And I still continue to do that to help get rid of the limp that I have and retrain all of my core muscles to walk again. Cause amazingly in four months, you lose all that. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, so, and my last scans actually still showed that I have the same amount of cancer as when I started um, the new IV chemo treatment um, four months ago, but it's asleep. Like it's, it's yeah. stable. So we're happy about that. That's good. <laughs> you know, yeah, we take the good gone, news when we but, can. So yes. But, you know, we continue to travel. That hasn't stopped. Um, we figured out, like, this is what happens with, with my treatments. I figure out what are my down days, and they're usually like two to three days afterwards. I don't plan anything. I have meals set up, so people bring me meals, which is such a gift. Mm-hmm. And people are always looking to wait, uh, ways to help you. And so I think that's such a big part of it, is letting people help the way that you really need it, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, And then like really set myself up for success so that the more I rest, the quicker I bounce back. And the more I rest at night, I go to bed at 730 so that I have like 10 to 12 hours in bed so that I can function and do stuff during the day and we can do things together and go speak when we're asked to speak somewhere or travel when we're asked to travel. And we even recently just wrote a book together. So it's our story together. Um, And it comes out in October. So we're super excited about that. It's called how to get up and live. So that's our, our motto. Our life motto is get up and live. It just, just happened. You know, when we're coaching people, you know, um, their doctor, you know, they're like, my doctor didn't say if I could, you know, go for a walk, you know, get in the pool and stretch. And so I tell them what I did through my journey. They go, I I didn't know it. So our motto became get up and live, you know, get up and do something. It's a diagnosis with cancer. It's, 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 it's a situation, not a sentence, you know, how you handle it. How you handle it, you know, is basically up to you. You can stay in the bed or you can stay on the couch all day and feel sorry for yourself. And and, and there's something about that, you know, what what I've seen through the hundreds of people that we coach around the country is you're either you're either busy dying or you're busy living. And 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 that sounds like a cliche, but basically what happens is you're on the couch or you're in the bed with the covers pulled up, feeling sorry for yourself, or you're in the fight mode. And so when you start juicing and using oils and exercising and praying and meditating and sound healing and all the stuff that we love, the thing is now you've put what I call boots on the ground. You're moving, you're moving your body. And there's something to be said about the power of the mind. And when you get into fight mode, it's a little different walk than the feeling sorry for yourself mode. And and all of a sudden people are really actually living their life, even with cancer going on in their life. So you know, it's a, it's a, it's a huge coaching point, you know, and everything we went through, we lived out loud. You know, you guys, you guys can go back on our Facebook page and watch this last year. And there was places where, I mean, we had, we still do. We have thousands of people sending in messages daily. They're praying for Hannah. They're praying for Hannah. 
So we've got this huge positive wave started and um, it's, 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 it's a tough journey. Um, we could make the other decision and we could stay on the couch also and say, this stinks, but you know, she'll stay on the couch for maybe two days after chemo. And then she's like, let's go. And when we say, let's go, we go. I mean, it's not like we're going to go, you know, down to the mailbox and back. We're going to Denver, Colorado for nine days and doing four speaking events for the cancer foundation. We're going all over the place. So, you know, that's really, really what we do, but you know, we coach people right where they're at and most of it's confusion and being scared. It's, it, it's, it's just stinks going through what we're going through. And it's scary, you know, when your body starts not responding to things that you want it to do or things are growing that you don't want to grow, it's scary. And so we coach people starting right where they're at. And it might be getting on their floor and typing on YouTube, on your TV, a stretching class or a controlled breathing class, but you're starting to get in motion. And eventually it might be a yoga class or, a, you know, something else or a walk around the block with your husband or your dog or whatever, whatever that may be. But it starts slow. Another thing that I wanted to add also is everything that we've done from starting this foundation, anybody can do it. We it looked like a mountain of meat just because I never done it before. I was like, I don't know anything about, you know, a 501c3 nonprofit because I had a landscaping business, you know. And uh, we, we, we researched and read and asked a lot of questions every single step of the way. And now when people say something about, you know, I'm going through a journey with cancer and I feel like I really feel like I should be helping other people. And I say, well, in what way? Well, I think I should write a book about my story. I love people. that I love everybody should write a book, even if you don't publish it. Because of where you where you got to go when you write that book and in that detail and bringing it all back, it's 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 like therapy. Um, and then you know the people that want to stand on stage and be a public speaker, the people that want to just coach somebody else going through their journey, um, we we coach all this stuff because we did it ourselves, and it's all just baby steps and learning it. And then any anybody can do what we've done. We just we just it's just snowballing now. We've we've created some momentum. And it's growing and more people are hearing about us. So, um, yeah, and it's actually our goal to um, eventually come up with a curriculum to teach other people how to coach and certify them and have that be part of our Living Hope Cancer Foundation organization. And we also have a big dream to have a cancer retreat center where we can host patients and their caregivers and teach them all of these things in a few days. And interestingly, like when I first heard about Chuck, I actually stalked him on Facebook and saw him juicing, which is funny because I had been juicing. So both like before we both met each other for years, we had been juicing. So when he met, it was like, yeah, we're just going to keep going. So we actually juice every two days and have enough for the next day um, regularly. And part of that also is because I can't even eat a raw carrot right now. I can't swallow it. So it's great because I know I'm getting like this straight shot of nutrition right to the mitochondria of my cells. And it's way better for me than drinking a smoothie where your body still has to digest it. I love that about juice. It's like, go straight to your cells. So just that shot, we call it our raw fuel. Yeah. We love it. And, and also then when it went, besides us doing it, which we love the feel of when we don't do it, Hannah will say, I'm really tired today. We need juice. Mm -hmm. We can tell the difference. But also when we started coaching people going through their cancer, um, what I found was really, really hard to do is um, I can lead them to dietitians and dietitians, um, you know, different uh, social media pages and stuff. But we got a lot of people that aren't going to change their diet. And when we realize this, we're like, you know, how are we going to get these people healthy and get their immune system cranked up? Um, because it wants to, even going through cancer and chemo and radiation, and all this stuff, it wants to if it has the right fuel. So what we what we started coaching was the juicing because a lot of people aren't changing their diets. And so what had happened was it was a way to get good nutrition in their body. And then it's kind of interesting, you know, once you start juicing for two or three weeks and all of a sudden it's like, you know what? 
my wife's apple pie sitting over there don't sound so good anymore before bed at night. You know, I'm juicing now and I'm walking and I have energy. So slowly the juicing thing not only is for the immune system and for the human body, um, but it's also because a lot of people, are, they're not going to change their diets. They don't want to change their diets. And um, that's okay. You know, the thing is we still got to get some nutrition in there um, so the immune system can do what it's supposed to do in the first place. What a great message. And you're approaching it from the right holistic way of, well, we're not asking you to change, but let's add something really beneficial to you. And then they come to that choice if they want to over time for themselves. The, the thing about juicing also is that raw, that raw nutrition, that's live nutrition, um, is so important for our human bodies. And so our recipe that we have on our site is enough that we have a glass today and tomorrow and that, that it's usually gone. Mm -hmm. But if, so, if I'm coaching somebody and they say, hey, it's day number two and I still got, um, you know, another full glass of juice in the pitcher in there, I tell them to dump it down the drain because after two days, it starts to lose its nutritional value and its enzymes. Mm. And it's not as it's not as good for you as good, fresh juice. So I, I at the end of yeah. two days, they dump it out and start all over again. Um, and another little um, fun thing is the thing that catches all the debris in your juicer, I have them line it with a little bag from the, you know, a grocery, store. grocery store bag or a little garbage bag. And then all the debris, all the fiber goes into there and they just pull it out and throw it away. So it, it helps oh, with the clean up a little bit. Easy. Yeah. That is easy. And depending on what you're juicing too, I've started, um, like if you're doing, what was it? Uh, was it carrot or something? I started making like grain free, like muffins and stuff and using some of the fiber in other baking items. So just again, like yeah. repurposing yeah. things as much as possible and or composting, et cetera. There's so many yep. things that you could be doing. And yeah. it's that whole like lifestyle piece. And you could just start with yeah. a very healthy drink. So we're going to turn everybody into hippies. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Love it. <laughs> well, if you guys are ever speaking um, on the East Coast, please look us up. We're in Boston and we travel a lot too. We were out in Portland, Oregon, speaking at the Relay for Life for a little while. And going back to what you were saying, we were talking about like, we have cancer. It's not just me and William, the caregiver. It's like, William's going through cancer too. He's, he doesn't physically have it, but he's dealing with all of it. And just yeah. using the nomenclatures of like in the, the uh, pronouns, like we have cancer, we're managing cancer because it's not just the individual. It's like the community, the neighbors, the family, the children, you know, your mm -hmm. sons that are experiencing this with you. So mm -hmm. I really appreciate you like sharing your story. I really hope this is the beginning of many more. You guys are just like such awesome, like vibrant energy, like, such oh, I'm just so thrilled. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's just wonderful to have you on the podcast. And I really hope we can continue the conversation. This is just like, so like, inspiring on so many levels. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much. We just want to remind everybody to get up and live. Yes, we will. hundred <laughs> percent. Well, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and listening to our podcast. Be sure to follow us on social media and I'll link to all of our handles below. It would mean the absolute world to me if you could share this episode on social media. If we could reach just one more person, my heart would be filled. Your thumbs up, likes, hearts, comments, and shares are a great way to advocate and help elevate our voices and those of our guests. You can find out more about our organization and upcoming events and ways to connect via our website, survivingbreastcancer.org. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast is from personal experiences and is not a substitute for medical advice. Until next time, keep on thriving.